So I am my managing director at IMC. It's my day job. Uh, IMC is a, a large, one of the largest electronic market making firms in the world. About 550 people worldwide, offices all over the world, provide liquidity and options. Uh, we are market makers and options, ETFs, futures, whatever equity, whatever asset class it trades on the screen. Um, I'll, uh, also, we have set up a European Principal Traders Association under the auspices of the FAA. And now we have uh, 23 members. Uh, I think that in terms of uh, the membership, I won't you know, go into it very, very long. I'm sure some of you will have met us already. Um, I think that uh, what's relevant here is that in the equity markets, probably you can assume that one out of three trades in the equity markets will have uh, one of these members as a uh, counterparty on one, either one of those trades. So. Hopefully that does away with this concept of fake liquidity. Um, the, uh, and then we also, in the derivative markets, will have uh, you know, obviously much even higher member and uh, higher market shares than that. We like regulation uh, because regulations lowers the barriers to entry, usually, and it fosters transparency. And transparency is key if you're a electronic market maker firm or a liquidity provider. You need transparency. We have no clients, so we can't trade. We have no prior knowledge of anything in the market. We do depend on transparency for our strategies, and I'll go into that a little bit later. I'm going to show something that's fairly similar to what my colleague has showed, um, but I, so I, I can sail through this a bit quicker. Um, but this is the old days, and uh, this is really more the equity markets. So. Institution A on the left, Institution B on the right want to buy and sell. 10 to 15 years ago, they would call their broker, their sales trader would pick up the phone, give the order to the trader, the trader would then call the floor, the floor uh, broker would pick up the phone, and so on and so on, and the specialist would execute the trade, and then the whole process would start again. So an enormous amount of frictional cost. Not only all these people had to be paid money for what they did, which in some cases was a fairly low value added, and I can vouch for that because I ran one of the large trading desks in the city uh, until uh, five years ago. Um, that was a very large business in the city, and that's a much smaller business today because of this, because this is what happens today. So these um, institutions now are empowered to access these markets directly through algorithms provided by my colleague on the right, and they trade on an electronic platform. And what you don't have on these platforms is the old specialist. Now, what you have on these platforms, or the old CEC market maker, or the old NASDAQ market maker, you have new market makers, new liquidity providers, who are making sure that when institution A want to buy and institution B want to sell, it rarely happens that they want to do that at exactly the same time. There's always somebody who's willing to step in between. So this has caused uh, a huge paradigm shift in the market. So this used to be a very large business in the city. I think the average desk would have, in the year 2000, probably had revenues of a billion to a billion and a half euros. That desk now probably has, there's not even a fifth of that left today. So when you think about how do you want to uh, reduce frictional costs, technology and these lowering barriers to entry is something that is incredibly effective to cutting the, some of the maybe bonus cultures as well that we have seen in the past. Um, why is speed important in this? Speed is important to a market maker because a market maker's quote, if he enters it into the system, is valid until he cancels it. I.e., if an exchange trade, if an exchange takes a long time to process this cancellation, and when the market moves, they need to cancel that quote. He's exposed that market maker. So the faster the exchange is the tighter, the narrower he can quote, the narrower the bid ask spreads, and the bigger the size that that market maker is willing to quote. So the more liquidity he's willing to offer. 
a huge correlation between speed and capacity of exchanges, and I'll go and show you the data later on. Huge correlation, positive correlation between speed and capacity and exchange costs as well as liquidity and spreads. And all of this, in, in the end of the day, reduces the frictional costs to the end users. So the institutions who are representing pensioners and savers are ultimately enormous beneficiaries of this. So the pensioners and the savers will enjoy an enormous uh, cut in the ultimate cost that they pay to these markets as a result. So this is you know, what speed has, has done. And, 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 speed and it doesn't cause risk. Sorry? It doesn't cause risk. Additional speed. risk. Well, I'll, I'll have a... Because you say the contrary. What's, what do I say the contrary? The higher the speed, the more immediate, the, the transfer of... Risk. The more immediate yeah. the transfer of risk. So you, the, the, an exchange is for those who want to lay off risk to those yeah. who want to bear risk. So the more, the higher the speed, the more immediate the transfer, the more quicker you can get rid of that risk as, as somebody who wants to sell, or the quicker you can assume this risk. But right. For, for the so more, the more the, it's a, it's a for risk the whole management market, tool. Perhaps speed creates even more risk. No, speed is a risk management tool. Okay. Because if you uh, if you want to sell something and it takes a day, right, you're exposed to that risk for another day. So the higher the liquidity in the market, and the higher you can convert your asset into cash, the better it is for risk purposes. So if you're in a, for example, trading a credit default swap that's not exchange traded, that's OTC traded, and you cannot sell it because there's no liquidity in the market, that's when financial crisis happens. But when you uh, talk about an exchange traded market, right, and I think that one, one thing we should not forget, exchange traded markets have functioned extraordinarily well over the last five years. There is, you may not have liked the prices, your banks may have been too low value, you may not have understood why is ING trading at five, six euros, but you could always buy and you could always sell. So exchange traded markets have actually fun functioned extraordinarily well. There's no indication that these markets have become less stable as a result of automation. So I challenge anybody that wants to uh, suggest the opposite. But there's no indication that these, these markets are less stable. I obviously understand that markets, economies, markets have become less stable, but the microstructure of the market has been functioning very well. There's overwhelming evidence that markets have become more efficient and substantially cheaper for the end user. So Vanguard, which is the third largest asset manager in the world, they manage $2.3 trillion, calculates that with the uh, cuts in transaction costs that they have enjoyed over the last 15 years, the average pensioner that invests with them over a 30-year life cycle has, will have 30% more investor in 30 percent more funds in their ultimate investment account. This is Vanguard. So, improvements to market quality through the use of technology. Much academic evidence supports this conclusion. It's all in the back of the presentation. There's about 30 research reports. Uh, expands, lowers cost of access to information and markets. It reduces spreads. It adds to liquidity, maintains price and efficiency, reduces volatility. Average institutional commissions in Europe in the year 2000, 100%, and my colleague on the right can probably confirm some of these numbers, 100% of business was done high touch, i.e. over the phone, at rates as high as 25 to 40 basis points. Today, 60 to 70% of the institutions, they trade now through algorithmic DMA at rates as low as one to three basis points, at a 90 plus percent cut in commissions. So that's money that ultimately ends up with the savers and the pensioners. So that has been a huge value that, this, uh, that, that, that we have seen emanate over the last 10 to 15 years. Oxera, which is a commission, uh, st sorry, study co uh, sponsored by the commission coming to similar conclusions. Um, institutions will also tell you, well, uh, 
the actual cost, the actual uh, commissions, is not the only cost. The other one is market impact. This is a study, or this is actually data by ITG, which is the largest collector of data and makes this data available to institutions. They look at market impact. I mean, how much does it cost to buy a million shares of stock XYZ or sell a million shares of XYZ? That has also gone down steadily over time. So a huge uh, decrease in costs. 